Hello, and welcome to a new series titled Jesus and the Great Commission. Many years ago, I was going to a church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin to talk to the missions committee. And I tried something new as I sat down with them and I asked them this question. I said, how many verses can you name that directly relates to the Great Commission? Well, immediately they said, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. I said, good, what else? I was a little hesitant, they said, Acts chapter one, verse eight. I said, good, what else? And they couldn't think of anything else. They based their entire missions program on two passages. Two passages out of the entire New Testament, out of the entire Word of God. Experts in the field of communication tell us that non-verbally, we are communicated to us a tremendous amount without even words. And what was communicated to the... what? What is communicated to the average Christian non-verbally when you can only think of two passages out of the entire Word of God that deals with the Great Commission? I never would have said it. But when I only thought that there were two verses, two passages that dealt with the Great Commission, many Christians, along with myself, back in the early days of my Christianity, basically think that Jesus must have gotten to the end of His three-year ministry and in the last three minutes, put his hands to his head and said, Oh, men, wait a second. I forgot to tell you something. You're supposed to go reach the nations for me. Look, it's getting late. I got to go be with the Father. But I tell you what, I'll send you the Holy Spirit. He'll give you all wisdom. Zap, there he went. And we were left with a great commission as if he gave it some kind of a by-the-way emphasis. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to tell you. In this series, we're going to ask ourselves the question, is the Great Commission, is this promise to Abraham, is this top line, bottom line, upper level, lower level, does it permeate the text, does it permeate in the New Testament, and was Jesus aware of it, and did Jesus act on it in every facet of his ministry? That is what this series is about. In order to understand that, we need to ask ourselves a very simple question, and that question is this. What was the job description for Jesus? What was Jesus' job description? What was the job description of the Messiah? We find that job description in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. Let me read it to you. It is too small of a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. Okay, what's that saying so far? It is too small of a thing for you to be a Messiah to the Jews only. Or, I hope you've watched the missing half by now, it is too small of a thing for you to be an A greater than B Messiah. To be a Messiah focused only on the top line of the covenant, only on the people of Israel. It's too small of a thing. What else does it say? I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you might bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. In other words, I will make you an A equal B Messiah. I'll have you be a Messiah not only to the Jews alone, but to the Gentiles as well. Isaiah tells us that the coming Messiah was to be a Messiah not only to the people of Israel, but to all the nations, all the Gentiles, all the peoples on the face of the earth. Jesus was to be an A equals B Messiah. How did he do? Did Jesus fulfill his job description? Well, let's find out. Let's look at where he located his ministry. If we were to go to Google Earth and try to get our bearings on what was happening back in those days, you'll find a sea up above that's called the Sea of Galilee. You'll find a river running south, that river running south is the Jordan River. You'll find a sea down at the bottom that's called the Dead Sea. To the left of the Dead Sea is Jerusalem. Kind of on the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee is Capernaum. Up above that is Tyre and Sidon, which is in Syria, which is total Gentile territory. And to the right of the Sea of Galilee is the Decapolis. 
Deca means tenny, polis means city, the De ten cities. It was basically a busing project back in those days to bring Greek and Roman culture into that area of the world to try to highlight them or to educate them in the cultural things of the world. So that kind of gives you a bearing of what the world was like back when Jesus was born. Now, many Jews will tell you, look, Mr. Christian, I appreciate what you're trying to tell me that Jesus was the Messiah, but I can assure you he was not. Oh, why is that? You say to the Jew and the Jew will answer. If Jesus were the Messiah to the Jews, he would have based his heart he would have based his ministry in the heart of Judaism, which was Jerusalem. But he chose some podunk town way north called Capernaum. And so he obviously did not know the heartbeat of the Jewish ministry. He obviously was not the Messiah. That is spoken with an A greater than B perspective. Let's find out what's happening in the text. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. Verse 13. Leaving Nazareth, he, he being Jesus, flipped a coin and decided to go live in Capernaum. No, that's not what it says. Jesus did not flip a coin and decide to go live in Capernaum. What does it say? Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Do you see those key words? Galilee of the Gentiles. Now, when it refers to the people living in darkness, do you think that's referring to Jews or to Gentiles? Well, obviously the Gentiles, because it just spoke about Galilee of the Gentiles. When it speaks about those living in the land of the shadow of a death, is it speaking about Jews or Gentiles? Again, speaking about Gentiles. And what does it say? For them, a great light has dawned. A great light has dawned. Why did Jesus choose to locate his ministry in Capernaum? Well, it's very simple. Jesus knew that in the history of the Jewish people, there was the hope of a Messiah to come. And with that hope would have been enough motivation for the Jews down in Jerusalem to make the long journey up, the couple of day walks, three day walk up to Capernaum to see if this really was the Messiah. They had enough motivation because they were looking for the Messiah to come, hence they would make that long trip. Whereas Gentiles in that area were not motivated looking for a Messiah, and they would not make the long journey down to Jerusalem to hear of this possible miracle worker, though they weren't really sure about it. There was not enough motivation to go and check him out. Jesus located his ministry specifically in a mixed Jewish Gentile territory so we could reach both Jews and Gentiles because he was called in his job description to be a Messiah not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. It is too small of a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob. I will also make you a light to the Gentiles that my salvation might go to the ends of the earth. Specifically, he located in a mixed Jewish Gentile territory for the sake of the Abrahamic covenant. He gave an equal emphasis to both the Jews and the Gentiles. Well, did he continue to live that out? Let's read on down a few more verses in Matthew chapter 4, looking at verses 23 to 25. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering, severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he separated the Jews from the Gentiles, healed the Jews, and sent the Gentiles home. Is that what the text says? No. What does it say? He healed them. Them, meaning what? Both Jews 
and Gentiles. Look at the very next verse. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Jesus began to get a reputation. He began to make a name for himself in doing these miracles. And because he was so far north, large crowds from Galilee, we already saw people from Syria that far north coming down. It was a much shorter walk to come down to Capernaum and to check out this miracle worker. Large crowds began to follow him, and those large crowds were a mixture of both Jews and Gentiles. He was a whole covenant Messiah, not just focused on the top line, ministering to the Jews, but ministering to both the Jews and the Gentiles.